Happy Sunday to all of our Song and Sword family. We're so glad that you guys are uh, with us online as usual. It's summertime. I know you're traveling, you got stuff going on, but you can take us anywhere. Please make that commitment today. And uh, we're going to be here every Sunday uh, singing uh, a song of grace and preaching the sword of truth. And that's kind of what Song and Sword's all about. And so uh, we're glad. If you're new uh, to Song and Sword today, go to our website, songandsword.com. Uh, text prayer to that number on your screen. We'll pray for you. Let us know who you are. We want to get to know you. And better yet, go and sign up for our June 25th event. Again, songandsword.com. And uh, you can find all the information there. We're nearing 300 people that are registered for that day. So don't wait too long. Make sure you get signed up for that. We'd love to see you. Well, eight years ago, I had the honor of being the president of the North American Christian Convention. That would be like our denominational annual meeting if we were a denomination. But I wrote chapters to this book called We Speak, and it comes from where we're going to be today in Acts chapter 4. By the way, if you're interested in buying this, Google it. It's everywhere. I mean, I found some copies as cheap as like $2. So uh, you can find this still online, and uh, it's actually a teaching DVD that goes with the daily devotions that you can purchase that I saw this week. And I don't get any proceeds. I have never made any money off the books I write at Eastview. So uh, all that stuff to say, if you want to get deeper into what we're going to talk about today, about this idea of a church speaking. We've been talking this whole series about um, the the church that the world needs now are all these different things. And in Acts chapter 4, what I believe is the world needs a church that will speak up, that a church that will talk about all the things that have happened in their lives. It comes from Acts chapter 4, verse 20, which we'll get to in just a moment, where Peter and John say, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. And of course, there is a conversation going on in the world today. You probably have seen these statistics. They've changed vastly since I wrote this uh, eight years ago. But today, 4.89 billion people in the world are on social media. Over half of the world's population is on social media. And that they have an average daily use of two hours and 24 minutes on social media. Somebody's talking. Guys, by the way, that's almost 21 hours a week, almost a full day a week is spent on places like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat. 66% of Americans are on um, some form of social media. That's why Song and Sword values this medium so much, because you're actually experiencing it, and we hope that we can add something to this conversation. Because the world is talking, there are billions of words and billions of conversations and posts and and, uh, messages, all those things, but is it anything that's useful to the world? We believe that the world needs to hear from the church more than ever before because we have good news. We have something to say. His name is Jesus, and we'll talk about that more as we go along. Well, they didn't have Snapchat in the, in the first century world that we find this story taking place in, but there was still a lot of messaging The Roman Empire had its message about empire domination and propaganda. They had theaters. They had they had you know circuses they went to. They had all kinds of games that they would attend. Um, They worshipped pagan gods in their temples. Uh, There was Greek philosophy. There's a lot of conversation going on, and in the middle of that, the church spoke. So would you join me in the Word of God today? This is a great story. When people say the Bible's boring, I'm like, you have not read a lot of it. Because this is not boring. This is a great story. And it's a true story that takes place in Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 1. And as they were speaking, we're talking about Peter and John now, to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Now on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, all of those who were part of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power, by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. 
This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has now become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them in. They charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because the people, for they were all praising God for what had happened, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. God, we have just read the the breathing, the alive, the piercing word of God. And I pray that today you would anoint me to say the words that you want me to say, that every person that hears them, a single person in their apartment, a whole family sitting around on vacation, um, this uh, group of friends that's gathered here this morning, I just pray that you would move in a powerful way, God. Would you give me the words you want me to say? Help me lift up your son, Jesus Christ, in power. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it feels, if it feels like we've been here before, we have. And the here where this story takes place in verse 5, the next day the rulers and the elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, there was apparently a place historically near the temple that was a meeting place for the Sanhedrin. These were the religious leaders of the day. And their name there, you get the rulers and the elders and the scribes, they're all gathered together. It was apparently like a semicircular um, set of uh, tiered seats carved into stone where all these religious leaders, some scholars believe there were 70 or 71, we're not really sure, but in the middle of that, in front of all these smart guys, these religious guys, Peter and John have to defend what they're doing and why they're speaking in the name of Jesus. And and when I was reading this story, maybe you're the kind of people that write in your Bible, see I do that all the time, Uh, maybe you can circle these words. I I, want to look at these rulers because I think they parallel the world today and what we're actually speaking into. Okay, so first, first word is in verse 2, annoyed. They're greatly annoyed. I'll come back and talk about that. They had crucified Jesus and condemned him, and yet we're still talking about him. They're annoyed by that. In verse 7, uh, verse seven they're inquiring, and in verse 8, they're examining. They're, they're not really trying to learn anything. It's not like you would inquire and try to examine something to get smarter. They're just trying to trap them into breaking some law. And then finally, in verse 21, we read at the very end, they were threatening. They further threatened them, and they warned them in verse 17, and they charged them in verse 18 not to talk at all about Jesus Christ. Guys, listen, um, we've been here before. This is the same setting where Jesus likely spent much of his trial on the night that he was betrayed. And now here again, the people who follow Jesus are standing on the same stage proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. Fast forward 2,000 years, and here we are, still are. I believe we're surrounded by people who are threatening, who are annoyed, who are questioning, who are examining and trying to find fault with Christianity, and into all of that we speak. And so we've got that line there in your notes there, if you're following along at, uh, at songandsword.com. Here's the phrase we're going to kind of build each of our points on. In a world that's annoyed and questioning and threatening, here's number one, the church proclaims resurrection. That's the story. The story is they're proclaiming in verse 2, the reason they get arrested in verse 2 is because they were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It's quite a message. And remember, if if you were tuned into last week's message, um, you remember we talked about the healing of this lame man in chapter 3, that this lame man had been at this gate beautiful, and Peter and John, in the name of Jesus, had made him walk. And you know what happens when a lame man walks. People come around and say, what's going on? It's pretty sensational. And so as Peter and John see this crowd coming together, they say, well, you know what? Let's preach a sermon. And guess what their sermon was about? Their sermon was about uh, resurrection. In in fact, they were proclaiming it. That word proclaiming in the Greek language has the word angel in it, katangelos. 
is the way that you pronounce it in the Greek language. And the word for angel means to declare or proclaim or herald something. And they're just going, listen, if you guys want to know what's going on about this lame guy, we'll tell you it's about the resurrection. They were proclaiming that Jesus Christ has raised from the dead. And that's why the leaders are so annoyed. I mean, they got to be thinking to themselves at this point. I was thinking this way. He's like, I was like, can't we, we killed this guy. Can't he just stay dead? And the answer is no. He can't stay dead physically because he rose after three days. And he can't stay dead uh, internally and spiritually because that is still the message. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you want to know what the message of the church is and what the church needs to be speaking into this dead and dying world right now, it's the message of resurrection. This world needs to know that it can live again. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But look in verse 10, just to make sure that, uh, that I'm not uh, overemphasizing this. This is the message. Verse 10, when they're defending themselves, Peter and John say, this is by the name of Jesus Christ whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Resurrection is the, only, is the message that only the church proclaims. No one else proclaims resurrection from the dead. In fact, all through the book of Acts, maybe we've noted it, maybe we haven't, uh, but if you'll look at the book of Acts, Acts 1.13 is about resurrection. Jesus appeared alive after being dead. In Acts 1.22, when Judas was being replaced uh, as an apostle, they said, we need to have someone who's witness with us to the resurrection. In Acts 2.32, the very first Christian sermon that Peter preached, this Jesus God raised up. In Acts chapter 3.15, when the people started gathering together, God raised him up. The first church was speaking about this miracle thing called resurrection. People have, can come back to life. Specifically, Jesus has come back to life. But here's the message, and, and don't, don't miss this in verse 2. This is really intriguing. This is really exciting stuff. They're not just saying Jesus rose from the dead. They're saying you can raise from the dead. His resurrection from the dead is the reason that we can raise from the dead because he raises us. Look in verse 2. Greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus resurrection from the dead. In other words, they're not just saying Jesus has risen. That would be enough to make us pay attention to his teachings and to follow him and his philosophy. But what they were saying is that his resurrection results in our resurrection by faith in him. This is another angel word in the uh, Greek language, euangelos. It's got angel in it again. And this means good, you, angelos, good angel, good proclaiming. It's good news. We call it the gospel. That's the word that we see all through. And, and here's the good news that I want to share with you today. This might just be your sermon. If you feel dead, you can live again. That's the promise. That's what they're asking in verse 7. There's these, these guys are inquiring. They're saying, by what power and by what name did you do this? And uh, it's a good question. And I want us to answer that today. By what power and by what name are you going to share with people around you? Are, how are you going to speak into this conversation as a follower of Jesus Christ? Um, this man's healing, they're saying, was a result of the resurrection and the power of the name of Jesus Christ. By the name of Jesus and by his resurrection, this man is standing before you. Guys, the church still speaks this message today, that you can live again. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ and somehow you've been invited and you're watching or you just accidentally got to this website, I'm glad you're here because I want to tell you something. No matter how dead you feel inside, you can live again. This is good on the physical reality. Um, the world is filled with death, and eventually, in various ways, because of all kinds of life circumstances, every one of us is going to die. That's a reality we face at some point in life. And only the church can clearly answer this question. Only the church can speak to this reality. What happens after you die? And the answer in Jesus Christ is that you can live again. But resurrection is not just for when you die. See, I believe that in Jesus Christ, the resurrected life, the life that he comes and says, I have come to give you life and give it to the full, that resurrected life begins right now. And it's not just physical. Christianity is not just go, hey, you know, when we die, <laughs> we're going to go to heaven and we get to rise from the dead. That's cool. But in the meantime, how do we get through all the emotional and mental and spiritual grave markers that are everywhere around us? See, I believe most of the people you know, most of your friends, most of your neighbors, your coworkers, people you run into all the time, most of them are alive, but they're not living. 
And they are marked by these grave markers of emotional and mental and spiritual reality. They're unloved, unforgiven, unmotivated. They're depressed, discontented, downhearted. They're left out. They're left behind. They're left for dead. They're failed. They're forgotten. They're fearful. They have no worth. They have no purpose. They have no way out. Maybe that's you. Maybe one or several of those things describe where you're at right now emotionally or physically or spiritually. And the reality is that the deal is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead so he could raise us from those things. And I believe that someone of everyone we know needs resurrection. And the speaking church proclaims this, this story, this reality, resurrection. So if you want to tune out of this sermon right now, I hope you don't. But if you do, you got the message, resurrection. But it gets even better. In a world that's annoyed and questioning and threatening, the church boldly proclaims, here's the word, here's the name, Jesus. The church boldly proclaims Jesus. That's what they said in verse 12. There's no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. His name is Jesus. I want to get back to that context again. And what you see, these these uneducated, simple fishermen are standing in front of Yale and Harvard Divinity School scholars. These are the the experts in the law. They're They're the authority in the law. They run the temple and they run everything spiritual for the people of Israel. And these guys are standing in front of them, and these spirit-filled apostles are proclaiming resurrection, and they're proclaiming Jesus. And here's the conclusion that these guys come to in verse 13. If you have your Bibles, look. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they were blown away. They were astonished that these simple fishermen would stand before them and speak so boldly. They'd heard other bold speeches on this floor, but probably by the teacher Gamaliel or Hillel or Shammai, one of the the known scholars of their age. They were used to hearing great speeches, but not from some country bumpkins from Galilee. And they are amazed at what they're hearing. They're amazed at the boldness. And here's the question I want us to answer today. Where does the boldness to talk for Jesus come from? Where does it come from? They saw their boldness, but they noted two things about these guys. They were bold, but look, they perceived they were uneducated. The Greek word for this is really interesting to me, and if you're new to Song and Sword, you know I'm a word guy, and I think this really matters. The, the, the Greek word is agramatus. You hear the word grammar in there? A is a prefix that means not. They are no grammar, literally no letters. Peter and John have no letters. They're uneducated. They have not gone to formal school. They have not been educated in theology, Old Testament law, or what they called apologia, defending the faith. On the, on the flip side of that, the scribes, their name, scribes, is grammatus. They're lettered guys. They've written the scriptures, copied the scriptures, understand the scriptures. Here, Peter and John are boldly proclaiming Jesus And they have no education. There's another one, one of my favorite words in the Greek language. They weren't bold because they had special skill or charisma or talent either. Um, The word here that's common, common men, is the Greek word idiotes. I'll let you do whatever translation you want with that. I think it's pretty clear. They were just, to these smart, powerful guys, they're idiots. They are not lettered. They're not smart. They don't have special skill. But why were they so bold? Here's why. Here's what they noticed. They recognized, verse 13 again, that they had been with Jesus. The power in these guys' message and the boldness with their message was that they had been with Jesus. Maybe these guys are going, oh, I recognize these guys now. There were some of the followers of that guy we killed. But the reality is they're recognizing something else. They have been with Jesus. They have relationship with him. And because they know him and they've seen him, they are now bold on his behalf. See, here's what I believe. When I preach a sermon like this to Christ followers, most Christ followers are going, "Uh, I'm a little nervous about speaking. First of all, this is kind of a hostile world to say I'm a Christian or I go to church and and Jesus' way is right. You get a lot of negatives sometimes from even worldly sources. Or a lot of people go, I want to talk to my friends, but I I don't know enough of the Bible. or I don't know how to answer deep theological questions. Or I wish I had more ability, more charisma and outgoing nature then I'd speak for God. But here's what you really need to have if you want to boldly speak the name. You need to be with him. Jesus is the name, and we can boldly speak his name into this world if we know him, if we hang out with him. 
if we stay connected to him, if we follow him, if he becomes everything more and more and more every day, the more we do, the more we stay close to Jesus, the more we can be like Peter and John and boldly say, listen, he's the only way. That's the message. Verse 12, you should memorize this verse. It's, a, it's an old memory verse from uh, Bible college that Sarah and I at least have memorized. Maybe you have too, but, but um, Acts 4.12 is one of those major verses. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's the point. There's only one name that can save people. There's only one name that, that comes into this dead and dying and messed up and, and you know, tragic-filled and failure-filled and sin-filled world. And Jesus comes into the middle of that and says, I can save you. I can take your sins away. I can make your past better. I can make you move forward. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this world gets a little offended sometimes when we talk like this. Like this very exclusive sounding. That uh, only Jesus is the way. But go look at all the world religions. Go look at all the teachings and all the world uh, thinking. Nobody claims to bring salvation. Buddha doesn't proclaim to save people. Uh, all the gods of the Hindu don't proclaim to save people. Muhammad didn't proclaim that he could save people. Only Jesus stands as the guy that says, if you want to get saved, if you want to, if you want to um, change your life, then you have to have me. And this world that's lost and broken and sick and sinful, many people are seeking to save themselves. A lot of artificial saving and self-saving pursuits that we have. Maybe people think we're going to save the world through technology. The, the smarter we get, the more problems we'll solve, or we'll do it through medicine. Many people rely on medicine. Uh, maybe it's recycling. We're going to save this world by not polluting anymore and stopping the polar ice caps. from. Maybe it's pleasure. At least I can ignore what's going on in this world. Or maybe it's legislation. We'll change the laws and everything will be fine. Maybe it's education. We'll get everybody in education and we'll fix everything. All of those things that I just mentioned have proven through world history to be really lousy saviors. There is one. His name is Jesus. There is only one name that stands above every other name. And these guys are declaring it boldly because they've been with him. I suspect the more you're with him, the more you realize how he's the only answer and the more boldly you can speak about him. And that brings us to this last point that I want to share quickly. In a world that's annoyed and questioning and threatening, the church proclaims through living testimony. The church proclaims at its very best through living testimony, through story. The church never speaks more powerfully than through the life of followers of Jesus Christ who have been changed. Exhibit A, a lame man walks into the Sanhedrin. Sounds like a start of a joke, but the reality is that's the whole thing. We don't know how this lame man got there. If he spent the night with them in prison or they just brought him in and said, let's see this lame man again. But here's what we find in verse 14. Seeing that the lame man was healed made them admit in verse 16, a notable sign has been performed. It's evident. They can't deny it. Everyone knows it. They probably, we said last week that the people recognize this lame man who is leaping and jumping and rejoicing in the temple. They're like, That's, isn't that the guy? Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they saw the same guy. They're going, That's the guy. We can't, he literally was lame and now he's walking. We can't deny it. Now, this is free stuff. I, I don't know that I was going to uh, plan on saying this, but why didn't they believe then? If they heard the name of Jesus and they saw this man healed in the name of Jesus, why didn't these uh, leaders believe? Well, here's the reality. Some people's hearts are so hard, they're only going to believe what they want to believe, no matter what the evidence reveals. And so that's what, one of the things we have to consider as we speak into this conversation in the world. Some people refuse to listen. These guys should have said, okay, we give. We tried to kill Jesus. He rose from the dead. Now this lame guy's walking. We're in. We'll start following Jesus. But they didn't. But here's the reality. The lame man is now walking, and this is what we call a testimony. He has a testimony. He, he can say, this is what I was. And then in Jesus' name, this is who I am and what I'm becoming. He can testify what Jesus has done for him. And that brings us to exhibit B. Every person who's ever followed Jesus Christ can talk about what we have seen and heard because of Jesus in our lives. In the end, Peter and John have seen and heard too much. You know, these guys threaten them, don't say anything. Verse 17, they warn them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. They charge them, they threaten him, them. And, and Peter and John are just going, listen, I get it. 
You guys want us to shut up. You don't want us to talk. You don't want us to be quiet and have our own little church service over here in the, in the temple on the steps. But the truth is we've seen and heard too much. They've not just personally witnessed the resurrection, but they knew Jesus intimately. They saw him. They listened to his teaching. And, and again, I was trying to wrap my mind around this this week. They're standing next to a lame man who is now walking. They had seen that hundreds of times. They'd seen blind people see, lepers cleanse, you know, deaf people hear, mute people speak. They've seen people raised from the dead, not just Jesus. They're sitting there at this point going, listen, the rulers are saying, be quiet, no more preaching in his name or else. And they're saying, whatever, we've seen too much. And this is where you and I come into a speaking church. Of course, a church should always be speaking, and that's what I'm trying to do right now through Song and Sword. And some people are gifted to preach and speak and teach and all that kind of stuff. But really, every one of us who follow Jesus Christ has a testimony. We were something, then Jesus came in, and now we're something else. And so that's an encouragement. Again, a few weeks ago when I talked about, at the very beginning of this Acts series, I said, what's your witness? What do you know about Jesus, and what has he done in your life? And now I'm doubling down on that. Here's what you have to speak. What has Jesus done in your life? What have you seen and heard in your life? That is your testimony. And here's what's really great. You can't argue with a testimony. Some people in this world are just not ready to accept the resurrection. Some people in this world just don't want to hear any Jesus talk. But when you start talking about your story, they can't deny that because it's real. My challenge to you, Song and Sword Nation, is this. This week, share your story with somebody. Maybe it's just over coffee. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, through some social media, some post, some blog, whatever. Share your story this week. If thousands of us do that, then we'll make an impact and we'll speak into this world a message that it so desperately needs to hear. Well, what's the motivation? You might be thinking, well, why should I? What's the motivation for church speaking into a world that's hostage, hostile to its message? We'll go back to verse 4. We kind of skipped over it, but don't, don't miss the results. Many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Earlier we heard there were 3,000 believers. Now it's as much as 5,000. Here's what I want you to see, though. This is really interesting. The apostles might have been arrested, but their word was not arrested. Their word landed. Their message was received. And many who had heard the word believed. And this is how people come to faith. There's just no other way. Romans 10, 14 says it this way. How then can we call on him in whom we have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? You may not consider yourself a preacher, but you have a testimony. You, like this lame man, can share your story. And it's in hearing about Jesus and his resurrection in your life that changes the world. The world needs a speaking church because when we speak, people hear and people believe in Jesus and people live again. And if that's true, we like Peter and John cannot help but speak. God bless you guys. We'll see you next Sunday. Well, as always, we want to celebrate communion with you. This is something we do every Sunday to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I hope you have some emblems. I've got a piece of a cracker here and some juice and whatever you have at home. This is a, a good time for us just to take a minute and remember the sacrifice that saves us. In fact, back at that verse in Acts 4, 12, there's no other name that, that speaks of salvation. There's no other name given by which we must be saved. Today, let's celebrate us being saved saved by the broken body of Jesus that took our place on the cross. Let's take together. And saved by the precious blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. Let's drink together. Jesus, thank you for saving us. Thank you for doing what we couldn't do for ourselves and doing what nobody else could do. We praise you. We remember your sacrifice. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.